Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, most important things are said already. Um, the topic I'll be uh, talking of, and it's um, about a tool and also our experience, which we made uh, essentially driven by the operations in our company, um, where we run a lot of different uh, storage systems, uh, ranging from high highest end uh, enterprise applications uh, down to supposedly simple uh, Linux boxes uh, running uh, NFS or iSCSI. And, um, well, maybe some, some of you share the, ex the experience we, uh, we made in some places. I would like to start with a couple of examples. Um, first thing is, um, you run some kind of benchmark on your storage system, uh, like Bonnie++, IOZone, or whatever uh, uh, is your preference. And it shows you get a throughput like 150 megabytes per second. Okay, so you are fine, probably. Um, afterwards, you monitor what your real application is, uh, uh, is putting through, and it maxes out at somewhere like 50 megabytes. That's only a third. So what did your benchmark tell you? Example two, uh, you get, a, uh, you get a, a vendor of some, some systems um, around, and they say, oh, okay, our super high-end storage system delivers 40,000 IOPS, no matter what. Um, after that, you, you will notice that in operations, it's like 10% of that maximum, never more. Um, although your applications would like to have a bit more than that. Um, or third examples, um, you get a new storage system from any kind of vendor, um, and it performs excellent. You are really happy with that. Um, over time, it fills with data. and the fuller it gets, um, the, the more your performance drops, so sometimes dramatically. Um, and you, you start to think, what should I do in terms of benchmarking beforehand so I can, uh, you can be sure that I get a system that's... Um, that's please uh, speak um, loud off to the micro, please. Closer? Better? Okay. Um, so, so you ask, how, how can you... Uh, how can your storage system be benchmarked before you run into problems uh, while running operations? We developed a solution in one and one um, where we tried to put a real application type of load onto the storage system. There's a lot of applications which offer application benchmarks, but that's a, what we developed is a bit more uh, generic. Um, so take a Linux system, for example, and the idea is to capture just the I.O. on the block layer of the, of the Linux kernel. Fortunately, in the Linux kernel, there is an interface for that, um, which is called BLK, trace, block trace, and a tool set for recording data that goes over the block, block layer interface. So that tool records all, all the requests with a request timing, precise kernel timing, um, the length of the request, the type of the request, if it's read or write, it, um, it records the exact sector number it starts. Um, so you've got everything in place to recreate that particular load up, that particular sequence of requests. And that's what my colleague, Dr. Thomas schobel Toya, our uh, kernel developer, just did. He uh, developed that tool, BLK replay, block replay, um, which does this kind of replaying uh, loads. Um, uh, one short note. Um, the block trace uh, interface is, uh, is specific for Linux, but there's similar and compatible, sort of compatible interfaces also available for Windows or Solaris. So pick your favorite um, operating system and see where you can uh, get the requests. Uh, simple shell script should, uh, should trans transcode that, that format to whatever block replay can read. Um, of course, there's a, there's a web page for lots of more information, the source code, full documentation, and even a lot of data sets we recorded at one and one in our data center. Um, and best of all is everything, including the data sets, has been published using G uh, GPL or uh, free documentation license. So you are really free to, to use that stuff and uh, contribute if you like or ask questions to us. Um, and, I, and I think as a company that's using lots of Linux, um, that's the least we can get back to the community. So how does block, uh, uh, block replay actually work? Um, essentially, 
that picture is sort of as simple as it is in, in, in practice. Um, you put whatever block trace uh, got you into the uh, standard input for of the main process. Um, there's up to a thousand worker nodes which keep queues of the requests so they so that I can make sure that all the requests are fired at a precise exact timing as you like that. Um, there's a bit of housekeeping here uh, and the results are being uh, written out in standard out. Um, so you can pipe data through that or, or use files for that, um, whatever you like. The result files are then processed uh, by any tool you like. We deliver a set of scripts that, using, um, that are using uh, GNU plot and you get a bunch of nice graphs out of that. So, let me show you an example. Um, this is a storage appliance which we had in our test lab. And first I, I explain you how to read that kind of graph. This is just a duration uh, of, of our test uh, sequence. Uh, on the y-axis you see the throughput in I.O. operations per second. The green line or the green uh, pattern is what we originally recorded. The yellow is what the tested storage system made out of that. Um, we intentionally put a huge peak at the beginning of that test so we can see how the system would behave in overload situations and how it would recover. And what you see is that we get out something like uh, 10,000 um, IOPS, which is, well, acceptable for the particular kind of storage system. Let's compare that to a Linux box with a couple of disks, um, which is about less than half the price of the commercial storage solution. This is a, a, has been a Linux box, essentially plain Debian Linux and an, and, uh, an iSCSI target on top of that. Um, so what do we get out? Um, it's, it's the same pattern, only the timing is a little bit different here, or the time scale is different. Uh, and you'll see the Linux box also delivers about a thousand IOPS. Um, so this is good news for, for open source and commodity hardware. But now something interesting on the next slide. Back to our uh, storage appliance, which I showed you. Um, this is just a second run with this, uh, actually the exact same uh, storage appliance which I showed you two slides before. But this time we filled it up with data. Rem remember it's block layer, so no, no metadata stuff, no file system, nothing, as just a block layer. Um, and I can, I can assure you that the Linux system doesn't care if the disks have been written full or not. But evidently, this appliance does. What we get out is less than 5,000 IOPS. That's less, less than half than we get out of the empty system. Um, and this is, a, this is an effect we, we observe on many, many uh, storage systems um, which ha are commercially available. Um, and I show you why we think that might happen. So that's, for us, it's the most likely uh, explanation. Um, so these commercial things are essentially black boxes. There's most of the time, and uh, actually it's the SSD inside, and they implement some kind of storage virtualization. What does that actually mean in, in terms of uh, uh, physical ef effects? Um, it actually translates the logical block addresses to the physical sectors on the disks. And evidently, it does some kind of reordering. Um, and what, what happens is that usual ben usually benchmarks, including block replay usually, um, just touch a tiny amount of, uh, of the disk space. So that's a small working set that's be being, uh, being handled by any kind of probably any kind of uh, benchmark. So what, what these storage appliances do is if that upper band would be the logical address space and your benchmark touches a, a number of sectors randomly spread about, about the address space, the appliance would, would start reordering these 
in terms of physical location and put these just in the cu first couple of sectors of their um, physical disk space. So accessing that data is, is d significantly uh, faster than, um, than ad addressing uh, the entire physical space. So that's, that's one of the explanations that lead um, to that slowdown depending if you pre-filled the entire physical address space or not. Um, as a side remark, I may also say that commercial systems have been shown using block, tra block trace and block replay um, to consist evidently of a, of a huge number of different uh, software layers that are doing storage virtualization, that do a thin provisioning, that do tiering and all that stuff. And what we learned is that every single layer of complexity in the first place costs performance. And for some working sets, for some behaviors, for some use cases, some of these layers can give you an improvement. Uh, but many of, especially the use cases we have in our company, um, do, don't gain on these layers of complexity. So these layers of complexity in a commercial box just cost performance. Um, and this is, this is essentially the reason why for some applications, the Linux box with nothing on top of that um, is the most efficient system. So let me conclude with about one and a half minutes left on the kitchen timer. Five um, minutes. Your kitchen timer shows two minutes left, or one and a half, or something. It's it to have space for questions. But that, that leaves a bit of space for questions, and probably uh, one or two of, of you guys have some. Okay, so what have we learned? Synthetic benchmarks li like uh, IOZone, Bo Bonnie, or whatever you use um, are not very predictive. They, of course, for, for some dimensions, they have a predictiveness, but that's the reason why they exist. Um, but but uh, compared to your real world use case, uh, they are not very predictive. And the cru crucial factor that we identified for, for benchmarking is the structure of your workload you're running actual, uh, actually on your productive systems. What we can do with block replay is to recreate precisely these loads which we recorded in real life operations so that's there's sort of nothing synthetic on that. And the results of re replaying that on a number of test systems gives us a detailed comparison of the behavior like graceful degradation and graceful recovery or something, uh, s some other stuff. Um, what I can also um, tell you at that point is that we have a tool set which is also able to modify your, your um, real life workloads into some, some kind of partly synthetic workloads um, where you have constant request rates or, or, or st rising request rates. Uh, so so you, can, uh, you can play with your loads recorded in, in real life. So, okay, the experience we made um, is clearly identified. So, perfect timing. Um, again, if uh, that sounds interesting to you, uh, don't hesitate to visit our website or contact me or the author of that awesome toolkit uh, as you like. And now that opens the, the opportunity to ask questions. Please. Oh. Oh, thanks. Did you run the same test uh, with the filled block device on, on Linux? Yes, actually we did. I didn't bring the graphs. Um, because they look right exactly by pixel by pixel the same. <laughs> but we actually ran it uh, and ma make sure that, that this is true. But by the way, on, on Linux you also have, have, have ways of introducing that kind of storage virtualization like using LVM or whatever like SEV and a block layer on top of that. Th that's a huge, huge, opportuni uh, huge amount of, uh, of software that can do that and we observe this kind of same effects. So am I right in assuming that the behavior that you uh, can show here doesn't don't really depend on the actual data that you read on the disk or write on the disk? So it is enough to have the metadata and the access pattern, but you do not need to include the actual data into the dumps? That's right. Okay, so the dumps do not get like 30 terabytes big so that you c 
can have a small set of no. metadata and R can still recreate a, a workload of 30 terabytes or so. That's right. That's, ri okay. that, that's exactly right. We have, uh, we have only the metadata of the requests and not the content of the blocks. Um, but beware, uh, in the meantime, we have SSD on, SSDs on the market that are compressing the data. Um, so, so it's important to, to have a look at what kind of hardware you have on the bottom of that. If you have a compressing um, SSD somewhere in the system, uh, you should think about preceding um, the, uh, the, the data volume with some kind of random data or where you know the compressibility. Uh, zero blocks are very well compressible and uh, Compressing SSDs handle that very well. We've measured that. Yeah, that was my sort of my follow-up question. Whether, like in block replay, you just uh, pretend you 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 read some random data instead of just all zero blocks. Yes. So so okay. no, 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 nothing prevents you of, of filling also real data on the on the disk beforehand, uh, or, or do w w whatever you feel uh, fit for for your type of analysis. Uh, but on you know dumb disks. Um, just reading zero blocks and writing zero blocks is okay. By the way, uh, in terms of writing, we, we, uh, w when we have a writing access to the blocks, we actually put a, a sequence number in there so, so we can do verifications for um, uh, afterwards to, to see if, if the sequence has been correctly replayed. There's test tools for that too. Thank you for the talk.